Thank you very much, Jenny. And I want to thank all the people from my Loma crowd for the kind invitation. And let me share my screen now and put this in presentation mode. And I hope you can all hear me well and see my slides. So I think both uh, Dr. Schroeder and Dr. Callender did an excellent job in setting the stage. And I wanna kind of summarize some of the points they made and give you a vision of what we think may be happening in the future. So these are my disclosures and I'm the first to admit my biggest conflict of interest, I'm a transplant. And I really believe that this technology has helped thousands and thousands of people with myeloma. And yes, there are many other med medications coming through, but I think high-dose melphalan and autologous tra transplant is a, still a platform for long-term disease control. So let's talk a little bit about this early versus late transplant and what the evidence is. And I'm gonna advise you something I tell all my patients. Transplant's a choice, it's not a necessity. It's a choice you make based on the recommendations your physicians make based on what they think your disease is going to do with or without high-dose melphalan. You need water, you need air, you need food, you need love. Nobody needs a transplant, transplant's a choice. It just happens to be for our perception, the best cho choice for most patients with myeloma because it is the single most effective way to get as you've already seen in the previous presentations, long-term disease control. So you've seen this study a couple of times already. So these were patients were randomized to either get high-dose therapy early versus high-dose therapy late in the case of, re of relapse. And you've seen this again that yes, for the patients who received an autologous transplant early, they actually had better progression-free survival, which means that the time of disease control was longer. However, there was no survival benefit as of yet, partly because we have very effective salvage treatment so that once the disease comes back, we have ways of treating them. But what is the advantage for patients who got treated early with a transplant? That in the end of time, they really were exposed to less chemotherapy because they had a longer remission duration. Now, it is true that we sometimes say that there was no survival benefit, but however, for patients with high-risk disease defined as stage three or abnormalities of chromosome 17 or with specific cytogenetic abnormalities, I don't think that it was that, you know, these people actually lived longer if they had high-dose therapy and autologous transplant up front. And it was a significant difference. Three years overall survival of 50% if you were randomized to the group that had late transplant versus 75%. So there are groups of patients in which I strongly encourage them to undergo a transplant. Part of the fact is because they are likely to live longer if they do so. And these are the groups of patients that, as Dr. Schroeder described, have high-risk disease. This is the other study that we have heard a lot about today. Again, this is the French-American study. In the French study that has been published, and you've seen these results, yes, there was a benefit for high-dose therapy in regards to progression-free survival, but as of today, there's yet no benefit in overall survival. But what was that benefit due to? That benefit was due to the fact that the patients who had the high-dose melphalan had the deepest response, and they were MRD negative, as you just heard from Dr. Schroeder. And being MRD negative meaning in this study meant that if they counted a million cells, they were unable to find one myeloma cell. So a lot has been made about the fact, well, if you're MRD negative, it doesn't matter if you had a transplant or not, because as you can see, patients who are MRD negative after two years of Revlimid, the risk of relapse seems to be only 20% over the next 18 months. On the other hand, if you're MRD positive, the risk of relapse is extremely high, 50 to 60%. So a lot of our colleagues have used this as a rationale or as a reason to say, well, if we can get patients to be MRD negative with treatments that do not include high-dose melphalan, why not we just avoid the high-dose melphalan and spare the patients that toxicity? And we'll discuss that a little bit later on when we talk a little bit about that, you know, MRD to 10 to the minus six is not necessarily cured. So 
There are now the four drug regimens. And what I wanna show you is with the four drug regimens, again, we don't get everybody into MRD negative states, but we get to a large proportion of patients who are in complete remission. And of those, 50% of them get to an MRD negative state. Dr. Callender spoke about this study. And again, what I wanna show you is the importance of this study is that the patients who, despite getting a very effective regimen of carfizumab and alidomide dexamethasone, the patients who were assigned not to receive transplant during the first year, those patients had a doubling of the risk of relapse as opposed to the patients who had their transplant during that first year of treatment. So again, I think as Dr. Callender alluded to, there's still a role for high-dose melphalan in the treatment of myeloma. So this question of transplant becoming obsolete is again, a little bit, uh, you know, this misleading. Let's remember, how does, why do we talk about transplant? As, as Dr. Callender alluded to, transplant is simply the vehicle that we use to deliver high dose melphalan. An autologous transplant is not a treatment for myeloma. The treatment for myeloma is the high dose melphalan. What allows us to give the high dose melphalan is the fact that we have your stem cells collected and stored and we can rescue your bone marrow from those effects. <clears throat> As Dr. McElwan and Powell showed many years ago, by increasing the dose of melphalan, we can actually kill more myeloma cells. And more importantly, we can kill myeloma cells that are resistant to conventional chemotherapy. And this was the first treatment strategy that we could use to kill resistant myeloma cells. So I have a lot of conversations and discussions and debates with many of my colleagues who believe that MRD negative negativity should be the surrogate and that a patient who's MRD negative with primary therapy should not undergo high dose melphalan and transplant. And what I remind everybody is MRD negative just means that you have less than one in a million myeloma cells in your bone marrow. As we saw by Dr. Schroeder, this by no certain circumstance means a cure. These patients continue to relapse and many of them die from their disease. And although yes, that if you're MRD negative at 10 years, you have a 20% chance of still not relapsing. That means that if you're MR, that many patients have relapsed within two, three, four, and five years. So MRD negative is not a surrogate for cure. And 10 to the minus six, and our feeling is that particularly in patients with high-risk disease, even if they're MRD negative, high-dose melphalan may actually get them to even a lower level of disease. And I think the lower, the less myeloma you have, the better it is. And since your myeloma is not gonna be nice to you, we should not be nice to your myeloma. So this is what's happening in the United States. Myeloma transplants that are about 9,000 a year have plateaued. A lot of it because of the perception by many physicians and patients that, you know, with all these new drugs, I don't, won't need to get high dose melphalan. But you know, one, what we have done, we've broken the age barrier. We transplant patients over the age of 70. Two, it's still unfortunate that the number of myeloma transplants that are being performed in the United States is less than 50% of the numbers that we think we should do if you're less than 65, and only 30% of the numbers we should be doing if you're over 65. And there's a significant racial difference. So for patient, for our African-American patients, the access to transplant also seems to be hindered. So let's go back from a patient's perspective. What are the benefits of deciding to go to an early transplant? Well, this is the youngest you're going to be. This is the healthiest you're gonna be. And myeloma is going to be the least resistant at this time. And it's your quickest return to new norm. What's the benefits of delaying the transplant? Well, you can serve your quality of life in the early part of your disease journey. It does minimize the disruption of your lifestyle. And you hedge your bets because actually we do know that 25 to 30% of patients who do not undergo a transplant up front can still be in remission seven to eight years down the road. What are the disadvantages of an early transplant? Well, again, 20% of patients may not need it and we don't know whether it would have made a difference. 20% of patients still relapse within the first two years. So I say, well, why did I go through this if I'm dealing with this again? There's a 1% chance of serious life-threatening complications, a three-month recovery, and no proven impact on survival. 
What are the disadvantages of thinking about delaying your transplant? Two thirds of the patients will eventually need it within two years. So you do really are kicking that, the can down the road, not very long. 20% of patients relapsing cannot go get their transplant as a delay because the disease came back too aggressive, they got too sick, or they had not collected stem cells before. And recovery is likely to be harder than if you had done your transplant upfront. So what are we doing and how, you know, what, for those of you who are about thinking about, am I going to do this? Am I not going to do this? What can you do to make this journey as Dr. Schroeder very clearly exposed easier? So the first thing is you have to choose your transplant program carefully. Um, it's you get to know the doctor, get to know the nurses, ask them, do they do the transplant as an outpatient, as an inpatient and see what, what the team has to make your transplant journey easier. So as Dr. Schroeder alluded to, the main and most important side effect that most people complain about is fatigue. It is expected, it can last one to three months. You can do something about it. You can try to get your rest addressed, tell your doctors to address your insomnia if you're not sleeping well and balance activity with rest. So every time you, you have activity, you rest, activity and rest. Nausea and vomiting, we're very good in controlling. We have good medications, but the important thing is to prevent nausea. Don't let it get ahead of you. So take your anti-nausea medicine as scheduled. Diarrhea is a rare complication, but it can happen. You should avoid milk or milk products. There are anti-diarrheals that again, you should take regularly as instructed by your transplant team. And it's better to take frequent meals than three large ones. Mucositis or mouth sores is actually that something that now happens much less frequently than what would happen before because of the fact that we're not giving people uh, uh, the chemotherapy used for induction is much less toxic than now than what it was before, but it still can happen. Pain control is essential. Most all transplant centers are very good in handling pain. Your counts will drop to zero. You will be on prophylactic antibiotics. It is essential that you follow the instructions of your transplant team and that you take your medications as required. So I wanna show you a couple of things that are being done at Memorial about trying to make the transplant journey better. And what you see here is a curve, what we call a transplant symptom burden curve. And what universally happens is that most of the symptoms that happen, happen at the time that your white count is zero. This is the time when you're most tired. This is the time when you have least appetite. This is the time when your sleep is most disturbed. It is interesting that at the same time, a cytokine called interleukin-6 is at its highest level. So we postulated that maybe if we could block interleukin-6, we would be able to improve your transplant journey and prevent the symptom burden. And what you see here in this heat map is we ask the patients at the time they start, then on the day of the transplant, and then 30, at the end, 30 days later, how are they feeling? And the greener it is, the greener it is, the better they feel. The redder it is, the worse they feel. And as you can see, as Dr. Schroeder alluded to, people towards the middle of the transplant when their counts are low feel the worst. And then 30 days later, some people have recovered to normal, but still there are some people who still are not feeling their best. So we just finished a trial looking at siltuximab. Siltuximab inhibits interleukin-6. It's an interleukin-6 antibody. So it basically blocks the activity of interleukin-6. And look at what those patients have described. These patients really, they, they went through it and we're now planning a larger study to confirm this preliminary results that siltuximab can reduce symptom burden after transplant. We actually have strategies that we have been uh, explored and we've published. So acupuncture actually has shown that you can reduce symptom burden. In blue is our historical controls. In red, this was a randomized trial, which means that people were randomly assigned to get sham acupuncture, where the needle is placed on the skin, but it's not put into the site. And in green is true acupuncture. And these symptoms are, and here what you see is what we want. We want to be able to do your transplant journey and you will not notice the difference. You will feel as good on day 30 as you did before you got the mouth one. So these are the strategies that are commonly used. So we use 
anti-nausea. I mean, these are the current str uh, strategies that we're exploring. There's trials of microbiota. We'll talk about PK-directed Melquin in a minute. Dr. Schroeder talked about ice chips and cryotherapies. There are other strategies that we're using to prevent mouth sores. So interesting, we give all patients currently, the standard is you get 140 to 200 milligrams per meter squared. Patients who are over the age of 70 get 140 milligrams per meter squared. Patients who are less than 70 get 200 milligrams per meter squared. But when I do that, and I look at all the patients that we treat, there's a significant variability of exposure because not all patients handle melphalan the same way. And there's actually a five-fold, there can be actually a five-fold difference between one patient and the other on how much melphalan they get exposed to. So you have a patient who rapidly gets rid of melphalan, they have a low melphalan exposure. That patient would have, with a low melphalan exposure, we postulate that they might have a higher risk of relapse because they literally, even though we thought we gave them the same melphalan, they were exposed to a lot less melphalan. Likewise, the patient who got exposed to a lot of melphalan because they didn't metabolize it very quickly, that patient could have a lot of side effects, particularly a lot of nausea and, and diarrhea. So this is what we call PK-directed melphalan. We just finished a study showing that we can get everybody to a sweet spot. The Australians had shown that there is an optimal amount of melphalan exposure, but it was very difficult to get everybody into that sweet spot because of the drugs, uh, because of the melphalan formulation that was available. There's a new melphalan formulation called Evomela that's much more stable that allows us to do PK-directed melphalan. And we're now preparing a second generation of studies where we are going to get everybody to that, that optimal melphalan exposure and show that it may make a difference. So in general, the other thing is, and many of you have alluded to the chat, well, the disease continues to come back. What can you do to prevent it? So one of the things is, bring you into the transplant in a better shape with a deeper response. The four drug regimens promise to do that. The next thing is we are working with the graft source. Many of you asked, are you getting rid of the myeloma cells? No, we do not purge, partly because of the fact that none of the purging mechanisms that exist have been very good. But we do know that there are graft characteristics that enhance your immune recovery after transplant. And the group at Mayo and others have shown that the quicker your immune system recovers after transplant, the less your likelihood of relapse. So we're now working on strategies to see if we can identify what cells need to be in that graph to guarantee a quick recovery. Dr. Callender has talked about that, you know, we continue to use melphalan and we've been using it for more than 20 years. There are new conditioning regimens that are being explored. Some of that with radioimmunotherapies, some of that with novel drugs, and there will be a new melphalan-like drug called melflufen that seems to be more active against myeloma cells for which a clinical trial is now being planned. I think most importantly is what happens after the transplant. And we're now very excited with all these new immunotherapies, such as those bispecifics in the CAR T cells, we think that post-transplant, we can get these remissions to last. Now they last an average of four years with lenalidomide maintenance alone. We think we can get them to last even longer and hopefully without need of any treatment. And I wanna thank you very much for your attention and we're now ready for questions.